Um, I know this is very early on in the outing of the film. It's not been seen widely, I think, anywhere yet. So we are amongst the very first audiences to watch it. Hello. First, <laughs> first time I've ever seen it. Um, well, that, that, that's, it's, it's, it's a that. lie, for God's sake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People um, who believe anything. <laughs> and, um, uh, and, and also I know that, Mark, you've come all the way up from Devon to, to be here this week for, um, for doing stuff with the film. So um, we've, we've, we've kind of brought you over to the big city and, um, and, and you've, you've had your, your, your preview. How, how are you feeling about it? Because I, I have to say, first of all, the fact to have a writer and a director on stage doesn't always work, actually, because sometimes they're, 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 they come to such blows or fisticuffs by the end of the process. Friends. We hate and, each and, other, and, and, uh, <laughs> it's fine. No, I mean, it's a joy, a real joy, because the... When you write a book, you don't ever think of it as being anything else except the story that you've written to the place that you found the story. And this place was very important to me, the place Lescar, the village you saw there. Um, I mean, it, it was a place that we tumbled upon. We didn't intend to do anything right or make a film or anything. We just turned up. I'll tell you why we turned up there. We went there because I wanted to, this is pathetic, but I don't mind it telling you. I wanted to stand with one foot in France and one foot <laughs> in Spain. I told you it's pathetic, but islanders get like this. I wish actually more of these islanders got like that, but I won't go there. No. <laughs> I went up to the top of the mountain, but before we went up to the top of the mountain, the Pic d'Anny, and stood with one foot in Spain and one foot in France, we were welcomed into a home of a farmer, a sheep farmer, a shepherd, uh, because it was discovered that I had written this book called Cheval de Guerre. Uh, a little girl in the village had been reading it, who was the niece, I think, of the person who ran the hotel and recognized the name on the register. She came to see me, said, my daddy wants you to come for, um, I don't know, what did we have, pate and wine. It was lovely. And we started talking, talking. And in our talk, he said, I grew up here, you know. This is my place. I was born here. I was here when the Germans came. And then the whole story tumbled out. The so it really was a case that this was based on his story, was it? Absolutely. This small community in 1942-3 um, was taken over by, I think, 20, 25 German soldiers who had been then sent there, sent there specifically to guard the frontier because they knew the frontier was leaking into Spain, whether it was shot down them or it was French people who didn't want to be taken to work in France or it was Jewish people and Jewish children. And as some of you will know, there were safe houses all the way down through France where extraordinarily brave people had been looking after people and handing them on from house to house, and the last house before Spain and freedom and safety was on the edge of this village. And no one knew it in the village, but at the time there was an old lady who was looking after dozens, I mean dozens and dozens of these children, and they were being guided quietly over the mountains under the noses of everyone. Well, I was told that story, and I, I was moved by it. I was, of course, it was a huge reminder of the Holocaust and what happened there, and the fact that so many people weren't saved um, but these were, and people walked up the path where I had been up to the Peak Dany. These kids walked that way, and they went into Spain, and they had lives, whether it was in England or it was in America. They went off and had lives. And do you know, funnily enough, on the radio this morning, I heard the story of a 95-year-old man who had done exactly that. He actually had fought a bit in the resistance as well, but he'd gone that way over the mountains and ended up uh, in America, still alive. I mean, it's, it's, it's the echoes go on, and sadly, the hate goes on as well, which is what caused the whole thing. And Ben, um, from your point of view as a filmmaker, um, did you feel this real sort of sense of responsibility that you were kind of telling such an important story? And then actually, I think um, the fact that actually you ended up retelling the story in the actual location where it happened, which is very rare from a film point of view. Um, yeah, um, I think when you're dealing with World War II, true events, and particularly the Holocaust, you're at this sort of serious end of filmmaking. Um, and when the project was first brought to me, there was talk of potentially shooting in New Zealand or, uh, or Canada, both English-speaking countries with really well-established film production facilities. And um, you know, I was aware that you know, this place, Leskin, was a real place. You know, Michael hadn't invented it, it, it existed. It was you know, just over a two-hour flight from London. Um, and so I said to the producers, we should at least visit the place you know, for research purposes, yeah. if, if nothing else. Um, and I went with Toby, the, the co-writer, and um, we spent four days there taking photographs, talking to the locals, and um, came back convinced that you know, this is the, the only place where we, we should shoot this film. And then when we brought the project to them, you know, this is a, you know, quite an isolated region of France. It's like southwest, western pocket, the Valley d'Asp. 
Um, so they're, you know, they're certainly not used to having international film crews turn up. And we were, you know, we were very aware, acutely aware, that the last time that these villages and towns had seen German soldiers, yeah. you know, the, the, you know the, the Nazis were real. The, the ammunition was live. Uh, the, the, the flag was, wasn't a prop. Um, and we decided to, um, to introduce ourselves. We, we said, look, we'll host an open um, invitation meeting in the village hall. Anyone can come and they can ask whether it's about parking, whether it's about night shoots, or we'll, you know, any sort of questions that they want to put to us, we'll, we'll be there to answer them. Um, and when I arrived, the mayor just pulled me to one side before we went in and said, just so you're aware, I um, just wanted to let you know that there's people in the, in the village hall um, relatives of, those, uh, of people that were executed by the Germans yeah. during the occupation. That's very sobering, isn't it? Um, yeah, incredibly. Um, it brings it home just how sensitive and serious this story is. And from that moment, from my point of view, um, it, it set the tone that, yes, you know, the book is Michael's, the film's ours, sort of, so to speak, but the story really belongs to the people of this region, the Valley Dasp, and to, have, to shoot the, in their village and to um, have them involved in the film production process, you know, a lot of the kids you know you see in the film, yeah. the extras, they're, they're from that place. Um, you know, it was, we w we wanted to make a film that they would be proud of. Um, and, and and did they welcome you at the start, or was it, or, or were there some people who, because obviously it's such an important and personal story to them, was there some sort of resistance initially in terms of letting you into their area? Um, there wasn't any resistance, but they, it, I think the community was a little kind of clo closed off and a bit, you know, surprised that we would be wanting to do this and, and tell this story there. Because their history, um, w one of the things we did was we, um, we hired, uh, we worked with a, a French uh, production designer, so the art department was entirely French. The costume uh, designer was, a, was French. Um, and when they were re researching the, the, the region and, and, and the history there, there was very little because it's not, it's kind of, it, it is a bit of a neglected, forgotten corner of France, sadly. Um, and so they, they went to the, to the Valley d'Asp and they spoke with the locals. And because we had that French side to our production, our, our crew, um, they, did, they did open up and they, you know, they were incredibly supportive. Yeah, but that largely down to him, he's not gonna say this. What actually happened was that he went and made such a, I think a strong relationship not to just to them, but a respect for the story, um, that they also opened up to him. And what was wonderful about that, and I've never known a director to do this before, is he sort of, he immersed himself in the culture of that place. So he, he knew the shepherds very well and how they handled their sheep and the trust was built up there. Um, and then th there was extraordinary uh, stories that they would come up and tell him. And the other thing that happened, and you've heard it in the film, is he came back with this wonderful music which they sing now, the shepherd's choir sing it. It sounds rather Welsh choir almost in its tone. And, and he, I, I didn't know about this, he discovered that. That irritates me, by the way. <laughs> it's when I write the story and you think of it very, I, 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 I got that, I, got, I didn't even know about this. He found that, he found that. <laughs> um, but you, it, it was wonderful because you knew what you got then from him straight away was that he meant it, this wasn't messing about. And everyone he got to come and act on the place and work on it, it was the same. They were all actually, I think, really devoted to the place, the spirit of what happened, the sadness of it, and the hope of it. And I think what, what's very refreshing about the fact that the two of you clearly have bonded during this experience. The well, he's all right. Don't, I don't, get, don't, don't overdo yeah. it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed it's, to be staying it's, at your it's house in a yeah. couple of weeks. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's that you know that obviously you, you you've written a book and you send it into the world, but the you know obviously any film is always going to coexist in a very separate realm, and you can't just replicate the book into the film. But you've been very accepting of the kind of the changes that, that Ben has made in making the film in a way that I say once again not every writer has you know has has been in these kind yeah, of. But I've got a great advantage, you see, because afterwards, if, if like I won't ask these people here because it's too tender with him here, but I will ask later on when he's not here. I should say, which do you think, which do you think is better? <laughs> yeah, the book or the film? The film yeah. or is it the book? And if they say it was the film, it feels much better. I said, well, yeah, well, I was very involved in that. Anyway. And I said, <laughs> You've got all sorts of avenues you can go, really. No, I've, I've been enchanted by the sincerity of all. That's really extraordinary. And the beauty of it. I find it extraordinarily beautiful. And um, Ben, when you and Toby were writing the screenplay, what were the kind of things that you wrestled with in terms of what you knew would translate from the book and what you knew you couldn't take on that sort of journey with you? Um, we, 
from the, the the outset set wanted to be very faithful to the to the to the novel, um, in the sense as well that it, it's a novel that's aimed at young adults, it, but it deals with the Second World War and the Holocaust and some sort of very adult issues. Um, so we did set out to try and make this film that that would appeal to a wide audience, that, that w would be accessible for children, but that had elements in that would you know translate to a, to adults and an, an older audience as well. Um, the, the difficult thing was in terms that we were discussing earlier, you know, when uh, we had 26 days to shoot this film. Which is, in, in film terms, for those of people in the audience who don't know, it's an incredibly short amount of time just, you know, to, to film. Yeah, it's pretty tight. And I guess also you've got weather conditions to deal with as well. Uh, yeah, we had, I think we had eight inches of snow on day two, which, which basically meant that the schedule was torn up because our, our bear doesn't work in freezing conditions. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but we, you know we had an incredible you know cast and crew and and the, and the support of the community and that's that, you know carried us through. And, and one of the very fine actors who who joined you on set alongside you know Jean Reno and Angela Houston was was a certain M Morpurgo, who appears in the film. A remarkable, a remarkable yes. performance. A remarkable performance. Yes. Did anyone spot it? <laughs> no. <laughs> that that's what he did. I spent a day of my life walking up and down this street of this village, dressed up as a French farmer, practicing my French walking gait <laughs> with a stick, and kept saying, cut, again, all the way go back, back again, on and on and on and on. Then I see the film, and I tell you, if you blink, it's gone. <laughs> and it got shorter. Every time I saw the next <laughs> cut, he cut a little bit more. But you made it to the final cut, which is a good thing. That doesn't know. I mean, there are there's yeah, some very established actors. I was looking for the Oscar for the best extra, and I'm not going to get it. <laughs> I mean, maybe in, you know, if there's a new director's cut in the future where you kind of go for the full four-hour version, maybe the it will DVD come back in again. bonus yeah. features. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting what you just said about it being for young adults. I didn't write it for young adults. I wrote I wrote it for me, and at the time, I suppose I was about fifty something, um, so <coughs> a young adult at all. I wrote it for me, and I, th I always do that with every book I write. I don't have any child in mind, any adult in mind, I just write it. Um, the important thing with a book that you think might be being read or going to be read by young people is to have a, a young character central to the story, and that was critical. Um, but what I, I hate writing for children as if they're some other species, or for young adults as if they're some other species. That well, I think they can be horrible, but they are our species. You know? <laughs> But I think um, I think tying in with that, I think you know when you are portraying like sort of the Nazi characters on screen, it's very important that although they did unspeakable acts uh, of you know the most atrocious nature, that they are still presented as human beings, and that definitely comes across in this as well, doesn't it? Well, both that, on, and that again is very much down to the writer and the director, as a Toby and Ben. They 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 really brought those two characters, the one you really do not like at all, and Thomas Gretchen's character, who is the the human side of it, of which there must have been many millions. There must have been many million Germans who would wonder what on earth they were doing. Um, and that, that, that seemed to me to be very important. It, it not some, you cannot forgive the Holocaust, it doesn't do that. But what you can do, and I think the Germans have done it very well, is acknowledge responsibility and know the history, above all know the history. That's what's critical about it, I think, really. And I, I did, I had occasion the other day to talk to some children and I started by, by saying, do you, do, you, do you know about the Holocaust? And one of them actually said to me, who's he? So you can see this gulf between those of us who are very well aware of it. I mean, I grew up with the story, we all did in my generation. But it fades, you know, and they, children these days, by and large, very young children, are not necessarily taught that kind of history, probably because it's too nasty and unpleasant and you don't want to go there, whether as a parent or a teacher. And then it gets left out altogether. But and I guess before the, you know it, it doesn't happen. Yeah. And these are events that you know, didn't even happen 100 years ago. You know, they're still within the lifetime, me the memories of many people who are still alive today. And I guess the importance yeah. is how you ensure that future generations it's very important, keep yeah. that, that. And that's how alive. it happens in ordinary places, in ordinary lives. You know, this is, it's not all Auschwitz. You know, these people came from somewhere. Um, whether it was villages in, in Poland or France or Holland or wherever it, they originated, it, it, it is and could have been a safe house after all. And Frank came from a safe house and was betrayed and uh, ended up in uh, Berg and Belsen. Um, there's a story behind every one of them. And if, if they are bodies, which they are to 
adults very often in your head. And all that works is horror. But if it's someone you know, and we know Anne Frank, you read Anne Frank's diary, you know her. And that's what's important. If, if you can make a story where the person uh, is, is someone you can relate to, and in this case it's a young French boy who had a strong sense of what was right and what was wrong, who was quite capable of running away from danger, as we see him at the beginning, but finds his courage and realizes, realizes bit by bit what is going on and what is going on. Um, that seems to me to be important because they, all these ones growing up, they sort of get echoes of the story. And it's important that the echoes go ringing on. Otherwise, when the survivors do die, there'll be nothing left but maybe people say, well, it didn't really happen. That's around the corner if you're not careful. Yeah. And, and, and Noah Schnapp, who plays the boy in the film, a lot of people will have seen in Stranger Things, where he's part of a very kind of ensemble cast and has a fairly restricted amount of, uh, of, of dialogue, actually, within the, sort of, you know, the framework of a season. And in here, it's pretty much having to carry the film because he's in it you know, for the majority of, of, of the film. Um, so that's, that's a central and crucial bit of casting. Can you just tell us about the casting in terms of him and obviously getting the kind of calibre of people like Angelica Houston and Jean Reno and Sadie Frost and so forth? Sure. Um, so, yeah, Noel was actually the first actor to sign up to the project. Um, we approached him. Uh, we, you know, we knew he, that he was Jewish, and we thought that this story might resonate with him and um, now, you know we know his family quite well now um, Mitch and Corrine and, and it did yeah it was something that was important to him and his parents and um, what a lot of people don't realize is that when you're dealing with you know a child actor 13 years old he was when he when he did this movie um, who's the, the lead protagonist in this picture uh, in 98 percent of the scenes um, but he's having to do this with four hours of school every day uh, in France. and um, That's the other thing, isn't it? When you make a film with a child actor, they can only work so many hours on set and you have to obviously have to give them their, their education school, as well. Of course, yeah. Um, so he, he's under a, like, an enormous amount of pressure. Um, he really, you know, you can't, he can't just go take after take after take because we've not got the time in front of camera. He's on, you know, we're lucky to have him in front of camera maybe two and a half, three hours a day. Um, but he did enormously well, you know. In fact, he was, yeah, he, he couldn't have, he couldn't have been better, really. Um, and I think a lot of that came from his connection to the story and the the importance of it to him. And then the other actors, did they just sort of come along at different parts of the journey, or? Um, yeah, th in in the in the casting process, um, Jean and Angelica signed on pretty much over this um, over a weekend, which was a pretty good couple of days. Um, and you know, they, they were again, it was a massive for me you know a big uh, um, highlight to work with you know actors of that caliber because they, they've been heroes of mine for a long long time um, to, so to work with them was a real pleasure but also to work with them on a project that again meant something to them and when but also playing characters that shared a real on-screen chemistry and, and relationship um, so yeah we, we, are, we, we were really lucky and, and in terms of, I mean, obviously you know, the pluses when you're going into a project like this on paper are you've got obviously a classic Michael Morpurgo novel, you've got a great cast, um, you're shooting in an amazing location, but actually you're restricted in terms of the number of days you've got, you're working with children, you're a period drama, so you can't allow anything modern to creep into the shots because that would just completely ruin them, uh, and you've got sort of extreme weather and stuff as we touched on before. I mean, did you not feel daunted by that going in, or do you just have to just plough on? Um, you, you surround yourself with the best team possible and with those people around you, you, you kind of feel you, you have the confidence to know you can do it. Did you have to lose any material on the route? Were there sort of decisions where you'd have to say, well, these scenes, we just don't have time to shoot? Yeah, anymore. I think we, when we were in prep, I think we locked the script with something like 190 scenes and we, we had to get it down to 170. Um, but yeah, other than that, we, you know, we... We just, we, we just had a great team, and it's thanks to them that we, we've got the film we have. It's a lot easier, I have to tell you this, you may not like to know, but it's much, much easier to write a book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to deal with snow or anything. I mean, you just tell the story. You're in your little room, you tell your story, and um, I mean, why on earth do you bother? It's, it's incredible. I, I ask myself that pretty regularly. But you're, st but you're having to obviously research those. I mean, obviously, a lot of the, um, I know you've written a huge number of books, but many of them do um, return to those kind of um, themes of sort of survival, and they do touch on the war, many of them. Yeah. Um, so, so obviously, there, there are important stories there you want to tell, but you obviously have to do your research as well. Yes, um, I do. But I don't necessarily go and sit in libraries to do it. I love to talk to people. 
I mean, the farmer I talked to in Les was the, in a way, the most important source um, for this for this story. But I also was very, very fortunate in that I uh, had uh, an uncle who was uh, he was a uh, in the special operations executive in France. He was dropped into France to help with the resistance there, and he went down to uh, the southeast of France and spent. I don't know, two and a half years down there doing extraordinary, extraordinary work. And he came with a remarkable man who's called Francis Camarts. And he was a teacher um, and a pacifist at the beginning of the war. And then his brother Peter was killed in the RAF, age 21. And at some point he decided, I, I, can't, I can't sit on the sidelines and watch this going on. So he joined. He spoke French because his father was Belgian. My grandfather was Belgian. And, um, so he joined this extraordinary group of people and went down there and lived amongst the French people down there. And it was his influence, massively, that um, created the story, because I had the story, but then I asked him about it. And he said one thing that, and I remember him, he had very, he had hands, who I always looked at, because they were rather remarkable hands, but he was a teacher, so he was used to pointing. <laughs> and he pointed at me at one point and said, and never forget, Michael, never forget, that it was the women who did so much work in the French resistance. He said, we're all so used to the image of the beret and the Sten gun and running around, all that's fine. And yes, they were heroes, but the unspoken heroes, by and large, were the women. They were the ones who carried the food to the fighters in the hills, the guns, the ammunition. And, and every time they, they, they did it, well. they, absolutely. And they were going to be shot if they were caught. And so um, the, the widow Orcada came out of, of that, and that was really important to me. And he was also very strong about how it was to be living in, a, in an occupied country. And that fascinated me because, like most people in this room, uh, I've never lived in an occupied country. It's one of the things I think we forget here, that all those countries over there, as we like to think of it now, um, all of them, with the exception of what? Switzerland and Spain, in living memory, had jackboots walking around either from the east or from the west, walking around their streets, telling them what they can do and they can't do, what they can say and what they can't say, taking them off to prison. All this stuff happened to those people. It didn't happen to us. We had bombs, we had losses and all the rest of it, and I'm not belittling, belittling that. But he did explain to me a bit. He was a very modest man, Francis. He never really talked a lot about it unless I tried to winkle it out of him. But he did talk about how it was to be in a country and to try and go around unnoticed. And he was six foot four. <laughs> I mean, how stupid is that? Um, <laughs> Anyway, so he informed the film a lot. So it's sources like that that are so important because then, uh, as Ben has said, the story is so important, you can't mess around with it and just make it no. sort of like an action movie. It's not an action movie, you know? It's, it's about human beings and it's about dying. And what's and really things well, that really happen. Yes, and what's interesting, there was a, I don't know if you, a horrible thing happened at the end of the story, which did happen, and I didn't want it to happen in the story, which was the death of uh, Hubert. And if you go to Lescun, and some of you do go through the Pyrenees, do visit it's an extraordinary place. But there's a cross by the side of the road, just a little iron cross, not a big thing at all. It's there, rusting away. And that was where someone was shot. And there's no name by it or anything like I don't even know who it was, but it's there on the road and the, not far from the place they actually filmed it. I mean, these things did happen all the time, these, com these deaths which are just forgotten. Um, so, yes, the research is very important. I'm going to open it up and see if anybody wants to ask a question at the moment. I'm particularly going to ask any of the younger people in the audience to sort of start off with. But before I do that, um, one question that they may be thinking about, or people here might be thinking about, is um, whether either of you or both of you have got some advice you might want to give. Is there any budding writers or sort of writer-directors in the audience? Is there any advice you might give them? Yeah, well, don't be a film director. Write books. It's simple. I've just <laughs> told you. <laughs> I, I agree with Michael. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, we can well, um, answer it more sensibly later, certainly, oh, okay. if, well, if, if someone wants to ask. If somebody wants to ask that question. Well, the little girl who he gives away at the station is called Anya. And Benjamin, of course, is the one who waits and waits and waits in that house with the, uh, the grandmother. And he won't leave until Anya comes back. And they've made an arrangement between them that if they ever got split up, uh, the only place they could meet up reasonably safely was at uh, Gourmet's house. So it's called Waiting for Anya. Also, it's a really good title. <laughs> um, 
who asked that question? Who was it? Who's the awkward person? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it, it is a good question, but um, I can, can I ask you a question back? You ready? Okay. How long is a piece of string? <laughs> Do you see what I mean? I, it, it, you can't really tell when you start a book how long it's going to take. It's not to do with how short the book is, how long the book is. A lot of it's to do with finding out more about it and dreaming it out and dreaming it out. Um, and sometimes I write it really, really fast. I've just finished a book which I wrote inside six weeks um, because somehow it had all been piling up in my head, one thing upon another. Of a certain, it's not a dream. It's things that happen in real life which seem to gather and then, and then weave themselves into something else and then something weaves itself into that. Before... You know, you know it, you've got a story and it's bursting to be written. And then you might start another book and you struggle and you struggle to, to get going and then you know you need more research, you need more, to, you need more time. I tell you what you mustn't do if you're thinking of time is you mustn't worry about time. Because if you feel the pressure, and I know this happens at school a lot, get this piece of writing done in 45 minutes or you go to prison. <laughs> um, sort of forget it, you know. Just take your time a lot, I call it dream time. It's the time which you really need for the story to sort itself out in your head. So you have a clear vision of where this story is. That's really important. Where is this place? Who lives there? Who are these people? And then your main characters. What's their backstories? What sort of world do they come from? So um, it just depends how complex the story is. Do you, do you want to be a writer? Yeah. Do you? It's really good because you're, you're your own boss. <laughs> so no one tells you what to do. But write books, not films, OK? <laughs> after you, and I'll, I'll come back to Ben, but after you had uh, heard this story initially when you were um, in France, how long, if you can remember, did it sort of percolate in your head before you actually started writing it? I think I, I'm trying to think. I think we went back to the village, back to Lescar, to find out more. I think it must have been two or three, three or four years, and then there was time when I talked to Francis and Nan about it a bit, and, and that was m more visits down to France. Quite a long time, and I, I think I, mean, I was actually following what I just said. You, you just, we, I took my time over it, and if it's any good, it's probably because of that. I have hurried books, and it always looks like it afterwards. And Ben, from the screenplay point of view, how long did it take you and Toby to write the screenplay? Uh, well, I think Toby was 18 when he first uh, adapted He's the... He's now 45. The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and it took, I think it... I had to say it took about 12 months, but he was writing it, you know, whilst around his studies. Um, and then um, it was brought to me, um, and we, well, we did have a time limit on it because we had a, a 12 month film option on it. So we had to right. get it done within which, a certain Which you which paid for? Uh, well, Alan paid for, yeah. Well, someone paid for it. Someone paid for yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> so, so you do have, an, it, it, it's a good way to, to work it because you are limit, you've got 12 months, you've been yeah. given permission effectively to work with this project. Um, and in, in that time frame, you've got to get your cast attached and, and take it to production. And so I think we were developing the script for about eight to nine months. Yeah, but then Toby, before. Toby was, I mean, talking about having it in his head. Uh, Toby, would you please stand up? No, do as you're told, stand up. <laughs> like, would you give him a clap, everyone? This is the writer. <laughs> uh, and you had, to, you had to know a bit. It's really irrelevant to the question you've just asked. Sorry, I'm not, point. what's your name? Okay, so I won't point at you again. Okay. Um, the thing that was interesting, really, is how you begin a story. And what happened with Toby is he came along to a play at the National Theatre just down the road, wasn't it, Toby? Just down the road when I first met you. Next door, he, he about, yeah. Came along to a play called War Horse. Has anyone seen War Horse? <laughs> you put your hands up if you've seen it. Yeah, well, that's not good enough. Put your hands down. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point is, he came along at the age of 11. You saw how tall he is now. He came at 11, and he bought, no one else did, I think, that evening, a book, because I was signing. The publisher made me sit there and sign like a lemon just outside the, um, where they were all coming out of the theater, streaming past. They weren't a bit interested in having books signed. And there was a little pile of books there, and I signed one. And he didn't look all that enthusiastic, because I don't think he was a great reader. And uh, I, he, he, I remember he was wearing an England rugby shirt with a little rose. I've never forgotten it, really. And uh, he went off, and I thought it was the last I'll see of him, and no one else was buying books. I became a bit depressed. It's quite depressing sitting here not signing books when you're supposed to be. And so I pretended to sign some. I do that. But anyway, next thing, he comes back about half an hour later with his mother, and he's got six books, and he wants me to sign those too. So you sign very willingly. And I had a bit more of a chat, and he, I found out he was highly intelligent, a very sensitive and interesting boy. And um, that's it. 
four, five, six years later, I'm not going to count the years, my um, agent gets a letter saying my name is Toby Tallis. I want to write the screenplay of my favorite of Michael Morpurgo's books, which is called Waiting for Anya. So this boy of, I don't know what he was now, 17 or something, 18, um, or maybe less, he, um, my, we, we all said, yes, do, 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 by all means. We, you know, we thought it would be rubbish. Of course we did. Um, <laughs> so we didn't give him a contract or anything. We just said, go in. So he did it. And it was good. He came back a year and a half or so later. And what it was, he came back. And it was really quite good. And then the surprising thing was that someone wanted to pay some money for it. So then it was really good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and anyway, we accepted the offer, thinking, as you do, I'm afraid if you're a writer of books, you sign many contracts for films, and uh, you take the money and, and you spend it, and, and nothing ever happens. And then I get a phone call from my agent saying they are shooting this film down in Lescar, in the very place it was written, with this extraordinary cast of people. And I said, well, could I get a part two? <laughs> and the agent said, I don't know. I said, well, if I can, I'll go. So that's what I did. And it, I mean, Toby is extraordinary. It's a wonderful example, by the way, of someone. I was pointing again. It, um, it is an example of someone who had an idea and just went with it. And it's one of the things I love so much about stories, whether it's reading stories, being told stories, or stories on film or in theater, is that it gets young people thinking and writing for themselves and finding their own voice. And Toby found his voice um, in, in this and made a wonderful job of it. Could we give him another clap, please? All of you? I believe in unicorns, yes? Um, well, it, I'll have to tell them a bit, because otherwise I'm just having a conversation with you. Um, it's, it's really a story, a bizarre story, really. It's about a librarian. There are not many stories where the hero or heroine is a librarian. This one is a librarian. I can tell you exactly why I wrote it. I went uh, on a, uh, a speaking uh, tour, you can call it, to Russia, to Moscow. And they went, there was a competition there of librarians. And don't ask me why, but there was. In the Kremlin, for goodness sakes. I'd never been to Russia before, and there I was sitting in the Kremlin. And um, this competition, 400 librarians were gathered around. And there was a prize giving. The best uh, librarians in all of Russia, I don't know who judged them, were going up there. And finally, finally, there was this extraordinary cheer. The last prize of the evening was being given away. And this old man, quite old, in a very ill-fitting suit, got up and walked forward to this sort of starlet on the stage with an extremely short skirt, who was clearly the telly personality who I didn't know, giving away the prizes. And he took the prize. And I said to the person next to me, who came from the Russian cultural sort of thingy, I said, um, what, what's that about? What's, what's that? He said, ah, this is the most famous librarian in all of Russia. <laughs> Wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> anyway. Um, what this man had done in a place 2,000 miles away, his library had burnt down, or was burning down. And he had rushed into the library as it was burning down and began to carry out the books. And the town and the school were so inspired by this, they all rushed in as well. And they started carrying these books out and carrying these books out until the fire brigade stopped them. And he became a sort of a hero. And so he should have been. It was wonderful. So I thought, that's a story which I will steal from Russia. Well, I'm 42 now. Uh, as <laughs> anyway, I don't know. I do you know what is. I don't think I ever really knew I wanted to become an author at all. I'm not sure I even am one. I take I tell stories, and when I was small, when I was your age, and I'm looking at you now, what I did discover by accident, and I'm not necessarily very proud of it, but there's a there's something I did discover, and that was that. I was really good at telling lies. <laughs> I could get away with just about anything at school. And I loved fooling people. I was on a train coming back from my little prep school in Sussex at the end of a 14-week term. Hadn't seen my mother, none of us had, and we were really, really longing to go home. And they were all telling each other in the railway carriage, the steam train, you know, Hogwarts. We were all coming into Victoria Station. And we were all saying, I hope the train's going to be on time, or I'm going to Spain, I'm going to France, and I wasn't going anywhere. And so I did this silly thing, and I do not know why I did it. But to this day, it was probably the best lie I've ever told. I was sitting there in my striped blazer and my striped cap, and uh, I did this, and I looked at my little ticker tick Timex watch. And I said, well, 
I do hope the train's on time because the Queen's coming for tea. <laughs> and I looked up. I looked around the carriage and I had 12 of these boys looking at me. <laughs> That's why I became a writer. Um. I think, well, they scattered. Most of them, I expect, would have spent some time either looking for or being helped to look for relations who were probably not alive anymore. Um, and some would have been sent then to, they were called a sort of DP camps. They were camps where people were sent um, while things were sorted out, really. And many of them were in there for quite a few years. But then there was, some were sent to Israel, which was growing um, into a, a modern state at the time. A lot, lot went to Israel. And a lot went to America because they might have had distant relations there. I think they went wherever there was some kind of a connection or a, or a home, you know. Much as, in a funny way, it's an important thing you question to ask, actually, is that there are children trying to come to this country who come from Syria or they've come from Afghanistan uh, or Iraq and they have a connection in this country and they want to come back to the only connection they've got in the world. They're alone in the world otherwise. And... Um, Good and kind people are trying to make that happen, as indeed happened to Jewish people just before the um, Second World War, um, with the wonderful man who arranged an entire train load of, of children to come to London who would not otherwise have escaped the camps. So it goes on, this trying to save those who, who need saving, give them a life. I don't like writing any of them, really. Sorry to disappoint you. You know, it's work. I tell you what I love. I love dreaming it up. Do you like dreaming? Yeah, me too. I love the dreaming bit, okay? And there's this whole bit in the middle, which is hard work. You know, page after page, morning after morning, doing it, doing it, doing it. I get some satisfaction out of having done... I wrote this morning two poems. I'm feeling really up. And if I hadn't written them, I wouldn't be. So it gives me a lot of satisfaction. But at the end of the day, I just find it really quite hard work. The beginning bit is the dreaming, I love. The end bit is the best of all, is when there's an envelope that comes to your door about six, nine months later, and you open it up, and there you look at your book, and you hold it up, and it's like holding up a newborn baby. And here's the difference. When your mother first held you up, you did not have your name written all over yourself. <laughs> My babies had Michael Moore Pingo written all <laughs> over. And it just gives you a feeling, oh, that's good. So you get a lovely feeling to start with because it's exciting. The work bit in the middle, like that's the fish paste in a sandwich, and then the bit at the end, which is looking at the book and thinking, oh, you, you clever thing, you. <laughs> okay. That part of it came from my own village of Idisley in Devon, where there were two men in the village um, who were in, already in their 50s when we came to live in the village, who were... Down syndrome, they, had, they were people with difficulty and they could not uh, be employed away from the village. So a local farmer had em employed them and they were very much part of the village community. Everyone understood how they were. Everyone not just only accepted them, but they, the whole community made a, a place for them. In fact, there are two such people again now. And um, I think in a small place that could be done because everyone does know everyone. It is a big problem. Um, and now what we do in bigger cities and bigger towns. But that was the reason for it, really. And it's one of the, I was very, very fond of him, I know, when I was writing it, very fond. Um, and I didn't want to do what I had to do with him. But, yeah, that's where it came from, Iddersley. Wonderful place, lovely pub there, do go. And, Ben, from your point of view, a very important role to cast as well. Yeah, well, um, I, um, I spoke to a number of actors, um, and then I had a conversation with Declan Cole, who plays Hubert. And um, he told me how he, in his school, he helps kids with learning difficulties. Um, not only that, he has a relative who's autistic. And um, we just had a conversation about this and how he, what, you know, what it meant to him and why the, the character was so important to portray in a certain way. Um, and he put a couple of scenes on tape. And um, that was it. He, um, you know, I knew he was the right guy for the, for the job. Uh, it meant a real, it meant an enormous amount to him and um, yeah I think I'm glad you put it up because he, I think he's done a fantastic job. Writers we, we are in a sense all the same we write a lot from our own lives and our own memories and the, old, the history of our, our families the things that are close around you we grow out of that place. Uh, I was born in 1943 I've given it away now 
um, and therefore have no memory of war, none. I have lots of memories of just after the war. I grew up in London, which was a grey, gloomy place, uh, with lots of people who were traumatised. They were really sad. Um, and I was a very well aware of that, very, very quickly. I mean, I used to, with my friends, we used to play war games, and I shot more Germans than anyone else. I was enthusiastic about war games. But of course, it was just a game, 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 game. And where did we play it? We played it in the ruins of a house next door bombed out ruins. I didn't make the connection for a bit. But then bit by bit by bit, what happens is you see things which, which make you really think. And there was always a man sitting outside the sweet shop at the end of the road. And it, I always walked the other side of the road because I didn't want to get close to him. He had a Jack Russell Terrier, which I was frightened of. But the other thing was that he had one leg. And his trouser was folded over. And I never, never wanted to look at it, which I know is shameful. So I walked by on the other side. But he was had his medals up, he was very smart. I knew he was an old soldier. The most important influence really was about war and about history and about the past it was a photograph in my house. It was in my house in Philbeach Gardens in London on the mantelpiece. There was a, a photograph of my uncle, the one I told you about, who'd been killed when he was 21. I never knew him. He had died in 1941, I think. And um, he's very handsome. He looked like well, every, all the males in our family are quite handsome. Um, <laughs> But Peter was remarkable. He, he had this extraordinary face like Rupert Brooke. He was an amazing looking man. Um, and he was in his RAF uniform with his sort of cap on the side of his head. And to me, he was the great hero of mine growing up. But I'd never met him. But what I did know was that it caused my mother uh, an enormous amount of uh, grieving every time his birthday came round or every time November the 11th came round. There was a lot of tears. And you never want to see your mother cr cry. And bit by bit, that's what happened. We realized, all of us growing up, that this war thing had happened. And it destroyed buildings, and it destroyed people's flesh, and it destroyed families. And there we are. That's why you, and then you write about things because you care about them. And that's the truth of it. And that grows out of who you are. We were doing a, a faithful ad adaptation. So the, the ending was written for us. That's my cop out on that answer. Oh, so it sounds to me he's about to <laughs> blame me, isn't he? He's about to blame me. Yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. No, fine. No, it was all like to you. Fault. That's fine. Um, no, I mean, it, it, you don't know, actually, at all. It, it, it's not, it is when you put a full stop. At some point, it sounds really silly, but it literally is when you put a full stop and say, that's it. There has to be a moment when you do that um, and walk away. And very often, it isn't <coughs> the right place. And then you rethink it and rethink it. And what's really wonderful, about, if I can say it about Ben's um, uh, film, is that the, the ending is not as abrupt as mine in the book. Mine is too abrupt. I've looked at it. When I read that book now, I'm thinking, my goodness, Michael, you wanted to finish this, didn't you? And it feels like it. I think with the, um, there's a music which helps a lot at the end, and there's time. He spends time with this bus arriving and uh, getting out of the bus and to get used to the idea that there's going to be this meeting, um, which I find very, very wonderful. And because of what has just happened to Uber, it's really needed. I th think it would, would have been not a good idea, and I was slightly dreading it that the film might say, well, actually, it's a bit sad what happens to you, but let's take it out. Well, no, because that stuff is sad. And also, and you know this probably very well, that it wasn't just the Jews who the Germans killed habitually. The Nazis killed uh, people with mental health uh, issues as well, and um, homosexuals, that anyone they thought just wasn't appropriate, get rid of them, get rid of the problem. And so that was also the right thing to do. And then there was that cross by the side of the road. So I wanted that in, but I didn't want people to, to end the book. I never want anyone to end a book feeling so down that you can't cope with life, you know? There is hope. And um, we all have to live with that every day, no matter how sad our lives are. So I think hope is important, not just for books for young people, for, for everyone. I mean, Dickens is always doing it, don't blame me. Um, and only Shakespeare leaves everyone bodies at the end of the, uh, and then walks off. And no one's, and he's not here to have, to have sort of Q and A, is he? And then, I think that's um, a very um, appropriate way to uh, to end up. Um, but I'm, I'm so glad that we've had the opportunity to play to you a film that actually 
does end on a on a real note of hope. Obviously, it's it's a it's a, it's a it's, I mean, it's a very entertaining film. It's a very moving and thought provoking film. It's a very important film. And I think what is um, so important is that we mustn't forget what happened in the past. You know, th those words "less we forget" are so important. But ultimately, it is an uplifting and, and hopeful ending, isn't it? And um, and I'm, I'm I'm so glad that it's going to be released on on Friday this week, and that people around the country will get a chance to watch it too. Uh, obviously, there's a, a great book they can always go back to as well if they haven't read it already. But a big, big thank you to Ben and to Michael for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.